Welcome to Red Talks, uncommon voices on topics that matter, the quarterly Inclusive Excellence Speaker Series that is a partnership between the Office of Diversity and Inclusion and the Office of the Provost, certainly inspired by TED Talks, but with our very own Red Hawk Gloss. The aim of this series really is to showcase our robust faculty talent across disciplines. We are featuring intersectional voices on a range of topics that bear on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So the vision here is to expand our reach as a university within the local community and to advance as thought leaders on issues that matter. Why does this matter and why should we as Seattle University be engaged in this platform? We are in the heart of one of the most vibrant and creative cities in the world. We are a Jesuit Catholic university whose mission is focused on educating the whole person to professional formation and empowering leaders for a just and humane world. At the heart of Jesuit education is the search for meaning. We are educating students for others. And that means we are asking them and facilitating for them a process where they can begin to understand for themselves what it means to be a citizen of the world. The theme of this inaugural Red Talk series is women's voices at the intersection. The idea is to co-create together a forum where we can explore women's voices and women's leadership. This is really important at a time when women's voices are being dismissed distorted, diminished. We are elevating those voices on campus. So today you're in for a treat of a red talk that I believe goes to the heart of what it means to be a Jesuit institution, where the intellectual exercise is one that engages not only the mind, but the body and the spirit. In the Jesuit tradition, they very much valued the integral nature of the arts to human growth. In her newest book, The Source of Self-Regard, Toni Morrison explores, amongst other matters, the role of art. And in that book, she has an essay called The Habit of Art. And she's musing about what she believes artists know. And I quote, that art is not mere entertainment or decoration, that it has meaning, and that we both want and need to fathom that meaning. The impulse to do and revere art is an ancient need, whether on caves, one's own body, a cathedral, or a religious rite. We hunger for a way to articulate what we mean. So today's speaker will certainly help us challenge our unexamined assumptions about the role of art and the place of art. So at this time, I would like to introduce to you our provost, Dr. Shane Martin, who will introduce our speaker for today as well as her topic. Thank you. Today we have the privilege to engage another dynamic red talk by Professor Rosa Josie entitled Everybody's Shakespeare, Making Inclusive Spaces in Classical Theater. Who controls the canon, which has historically been described as a classic body of literature and knowledge that everyone is expected to know, is an important question for all of us to consider in our university community. As the great social movements of the 1960s and beyond remind us, access to multiple voices and perspectives is a critical part of learning. And while higher education has been committed to expanding the notion of the canon, even within the framework of the Western classical canon, inclusivity and representation are essential things to look at. One of the most definitive writers uh, in this classic Western canon 
is, of course, William Shakespeare, and who wrote during Elizabethan era that was hardly known for embracing diversity and inclusiveness, and certainly not by today's standards. So what does it mean for us to consider our more modern notions of diversity, representation, and inclusiveness on the classical stage? Professor Rosa Josi has been teaching at Seattle University since 2000 and directs one production annually for Seattle University's theater season. And if you haven't had the opportunity yet to go to one of our productions on campus, I really encourage you. I had the privilege of seeing our production in winter quarter, and I'll be going this Sunday to see the spring quarter, and they're just absolutely outstanding. That's uh, Professor Josie uh, has also taught at Hong Kong University, Hong Kong Academy of the Performing Arts, and is directed at uh, Cornish College for the Arts. She holds a Master's of Fine Arts in Directing from the Yale School of Drama and a Bachelor's of Arts in Theater and Psychology from Bucknell University. Professor Josie's professional directing credits include As You Like It and Henry V, with the very prestigious Oregon Shakespeare Festival, Richard III and Bring Down the House with the Upstart Crow Collective and Seattle Shakespeare Company, Richard II with Seattle Shakespeare Company, and Fenn and Twelfth Night at the New City Theater, and those are just a few uh, selected references. She served as the Interim Artistic Director at Northwest Asian American Theater, where she led the International Artists Program a Ford Foundation-funded program that supported multidisciplinary collaboration between Asian American and Asian artists. She was a resident director at New City Theater under the sponsorship of a Princess Grace Award and is a co-founder of Upstart Crow Collective, a Seattle-based theater company that is committed to producing classical plays with diverse female and non-binary casts. Please join me in welcoming our Red Talk speaker, Professor Rosa Josi. Everybody's Shakespeare. So I'm going to tell you a little story. This whole talk is kind of a story. I'm going to take you back to when I was an undergraduate student, and I was starting out in theater. And uh, as I was starting out in theater, I was an actor. I was acting. Shocker. Surprise, surprise. Not a surprise, though, because if you ask people in theater somewhere in their deep, dark past, they've acted, right? Because it is the gateway drug into the profession. It's known that, right? So I was an actor, and when I was trying to audition stuff at that time, ideas of what were called cross-cultural, colorblind, non-traditional casting were starting to emerge. And so the idea behind this was that um, you would cast people in roles that they normally wouldn't be seen in um, because of things like their, racial, their race, their racial appearance, perhaps their gender. They're controversial terms over the years, but at the heart of it is the idea that they would open up opportunities for people, right? So even though these ideas were floating around at the time, my young self didn't think I belonged on stage most of the time. So I really didn't think I could be anybody's daughter or sister or wife or mother in plays like Can a Hot Tin Roof by Tennessee Williams, or Crimes of the Heart by Beth Henley, both of which were produced by my undergraduate university. I didn't think I belonged in them because I'd never seen anyone like myself in them, right? And I also didn't have the wherewithal or the agency to question why I didn't see them. I just accepted it. It's just the way it was, right? So I just didn't audition. And I didn't have the agency definitely to demand to see myself on stage back then. It was just the way that it was. So I found another way into theater through directing, and we can all breathe a great sigh of relief because I was not a very good actor. <laughs> um, and, and I'm so great. I found what was right for me, absolutely. But over the years, and especially often lately, I've wondered if I felt like that as a young woman entering this field, how many other young people of color might have felt that way might still feel that way today. I'm here today to talk about classical work. 
And I want to just start by saying that I really believe that the contemporary canon needs to hear more from women, from people of color. There need to be more stories written by those people, and the contemporary canon definitely needs to be refreshed and renewed. I'm going to be talking about classical work because that's where I live as an artist. That's where my passion is. In a field that I have to acknowledge, it is a genre that lives in the world of dead white men, and often living white men, <laughs> as you can see. When I was first starting out as a director. I didn't question the genre that I loved. I have to admit, I lived uncritically with my passion. I was so desperate to get in the rehearsal room and prove that I could do this work as well as, well as any other white man. Just give me a shot. Just put me in the room. I was so anxious to get into that room and prove myself that I didn't stop to look around the room and see who was with me. I was often. One of the few people of color in the room, and a handful of women. Look at her. There's one. There are 13 men on that stage. There was one other woman in this production. This was even later in my career. I was blind to it because I just wanted to prove myself. Let me in there. Let me do the work. Just give me that chance. When I began teaching, I talked about representation and equity all the time. That's what I talked about. I'd come from working at Northwest Asian American Theater. These things were on the tip of my tongue. These were important things to me in the classroom. But it, I'm embarrassed to say that it wasn't until I was approaching my mid-career that I really began to confront what this meant for me in practice. Fourteen years ago, two visionary actors approached me: Kate Wisniewski and Betsy Schwartz, and they came to me. And asked me to do an all-female Shakespeare play. So the origin myth is they were driving together to do a show in Tacoma, and they were talking and complaining about how few roles there are. And, and really, they were tired of auditioning for the same four roles that would show up in any classical theater season and competing for them, not getting them, or never getting to work with each other. And instead of complaining, they decided to do something about it. So they decided that they would produce their own all-female Shakespeare play because all male plays were being done all the time, right? So they asked me if I would direct it, and I said yes. Um, and together we formed Upstart Crow Collective. And since 2006, we've done King John, Titus Andronicus, a two-part、uh, version of、uh, the Henry VI plays called Bring Down the House and Richard III. Working with Upstart Crow changed me irrevocably as an artist. And it's、oh, it's work in this country, all female work that goes back to 1999 with the formation of the Los Angeles Women's Shakespeare Company that was begun by Lisa Volpe, who you see here. As all female work becomes more popularized today, I think it's really important to acknowledge the people who have forged the way for us. So I want to give a shout out here to Lisa Volpe for her visionary work and her pioneering sensibility. As I said, Upstart Crow changed me profoundly as an artist, and I, I say this because when it comes to this kind of work, I wasn't sort of born knowing all of this stuff. I learned this stuff as I went along, and just because I look like this doesn't mean I know everything, right?、Um, about this kind of stuff. So I want to share with you some of the things that I've realized along the way. But first, I want to give you a little bit of context about Upstart Crow, who we are,、uh, our choice of material, and our approach, especially to playing gender. You might have noticed that the plays that I've mentioned are all what are known as Shakespeare's history plays, with a tragedy thrown in there for good measure. And you might ask, why would a bunch of contemporary American artists care about the machinations of medieval English history? And that's a great question. That's a question that I ask myself all the time as a contemporary artist. As someone who loves classical work, I'm always thinking about what these plays have to say to us as a contemporary audience. Why do they matter? These plays are about the rise and fall of English kings. 
Now, I can nerd out about the history as well as the next geek. I love to go into all of the historical detail, but that's not what I'm after when I'm directing these plays. It's the, the why they matter for us now. That's what I'm looking at. And for me, the answer lies in the fact that these plays are about power and leadership. They're about politics and war. They tell the story of powerful families in conflict. They're the combi ultimate combination of the political and the personal. They're about how the people within power, the ruling classes, the select few, how their decisions can impact the masses. Everyday people take us to war. How they affect you and me. They also examine leadership and the nature of leadership, which is something I think is critical for us as a contemporary American society to think about. What I'm always asking in these plays is, what is the nature of moral leadership? Who do we want to be our leaders? What can we forgive and what can't we forget? So these are the things that the history plays delve into and why I've been obsessed with them with Upstart Crow. In terms of our approach to gender, we keep the place within the patriarchal world in which they were created. So male characters remain male, female characters remain female when we do this kind of work. We often say we're not playing in drag because we're not trying to necessarily realistically convince you that you're looking at a man. So we don't overly disguise the female form. We don't wear facial hair. We wear our hair long and short, regardless of male or female. We instead go to a deep examination of the text to uncover character. We do talk about archetypes. We talk about what it means to be a mother versus a father, what it means to be a politician versus a warrior. We'll say a character might be delicate, a character might be rough or strong or powerful. So we use those kinds of words to talk about character, but mainly what we're after, what we're trying to dig and unearth is the truth of character in the work. Things I've realized how we perceive gender and why it matters. So when we went into this work, we didn't sort of say like, oh, this is what we're going to say about gender. It was just a big experiment, really. So we put the work up, and then we started to notice things. And one of the things that was fascinating to me is that people, the audiences would tell us they would forget they were watching women on stage. They would forget it was one gender at some point. And after the initial strangeness of, oh, yeah, that's a lot of women. I'm not used to seeing a lot of women on stage they would suddenly just go into character and start watching the play and watching the story. But then moments of gender bias would suddenly pop up in unusual ways because of the awareness that you were only looking at one gender on stage. So for instance, when you're doing one of these big political plays and everybody's on stage and it's a big political scene and, the, and a male politician in a room full of male politicians, turns to the one woman in the room who has dared to speak up and says, really disdainfully, these are no women's matters. The whole audience laughs, because Suzanne Bouchard's doing it, and she's funnier than me. But um, they laugh because of an acute awareness that the stage is filled with women. It's brimming over with women. So the irony of that statement comes out, and then you start to wonder why there... You start to notice that there are no women in that scene, and you start to wonder why there are so few women in the political realm, and why, indeed, these are no women's matters. So this is one of the things that, I, that really became clear to me in doing this work. Duh! Things I realized. My work life had been dominated by being in a room full of men. And that until I had started working with Upstar Crow, I didn't really think that I had the agency to change that room. Guess what? I can make the room a room that isn't filled with men. I can create those opportunities as a director, as a producer. I can change the room in which I work. I had just been so blind to wanting to do the work that I hadn't thought about the fact that I could actually change the space and welcome in people who had been disenfranchised from the work. 
things I realized, what it means to primarily work with women, and why access and representation matters. Upstart Crow changed who I am and how I work, and especially when it comes to collaboration. And collaboration is, some, is, a, is a word we throw around a lot in the theater, and with good cause, it's the center of our practice. It's the center of our pedagogy here at Seattle U. I'm fortunate to work with some incredible collaborators among my colleagues, and it's what we teach our students also. But as a young director starting out, I realized that I had spent a lot of my time having to prove my authority and expertise in the room, that collaboration had been more of an ideal than a practice. And I wasn't alone. Being in a rehearsal, women talked to me about the fa how they had felt silenced in other rehearsal processes, especially if they were one of two women in the room, right? Because there's the gender thing, but there's also the, oh my gosh, I got the role. So many women auditioned for this role, and I got it. I better not make any prob... I better just do my job well, right? I better just not make any problems, but not be labeled a troublemaker, not make any demands, because I need to be grateful for this job that I got. Women of color told me about how they hadn't even been invited into the room how they, no one had asked them to ever audition for a classical play because they'd been told that you'll never get cast in one of those plays, and besides, those plays aren't really about you or for you anyway, so don't bother. Women told me these things. And then we all found ourselves in a room where our voices were solicited and heard, and I found a new way to collaborate with actors where I could sit side by side with my actors, and lead in a very different way, where I could open up a room to a multiplicity of voices and perspectives, and I could still lead with vision and purpose. This is what one of the things that really changed me in my work here. Things I realized, how women with extraordinary skills were being aged out of the profession. Yeah, I heard that sigh. I heard that sigh, girl. Hey, have you heard this? I've heard male actors say this. A male actor just said this to me a few weeks ago. You know, he's working through, he said, all roles lead to Lear, meaning that he's working through all the, you know, working through all the roles in the canon to build up the stamina, the skill, the technique, the life experience to play the granddaddy of all roles, King Lear. And the cold truth in that adage is that there's no similar path for women through a classical canon. Okay, so if you're a man, you can start with Romeo, you can go to Hamlet, then Henry V, and then Macbeth, and then Iago, and then Richard III, and then Prospero, all the way to Lear. I've left a whole bunch out, <laughs> right? And that's all the same actor. It, wasn't, it took me like three minutes to find pictures of Ian McKellen playing all these roles, right? <laughs> For a woman, you get up to Lady Macbeth, and then you play Cleopatra, and then maybe there's Volumnia and Coriolanus, that famous role you all know, right? <laughs> and then, what is there? You're kind of done, right? Harriet Walter, the great classical actor, puts it really eloquently in her book, Brutus and Other Heroines, which you should all get and read, um, when she says she reached a point in her career where she was confronting the fact that maybe her Shakespeare days were over. And she says, it was like being a concert pianist forbidden to open the lid of a piano. It breaks my heart. Luckily for her, that's when Phyllida Lloyd approached her about doing all-female Shakespeare, and we got to see her Henry IV, we got to see her Brutus, we got to see her Prospero, hopefully we'll get to see her Lear. It takes great skill, stamina, technique, experience to do classical work, to make the words fly effortlessly and sing, to take us to the authentic core of a deep human experience. And just when women have mastered this skill, they're at the top of their game. They're like elite athletes on the court. They are virtuosic musicians. They're told, oops, sorry, 
There's no more place for you. There's no more work for you. This is why companies like Upstart Crow and this kind of work is necessary. Things I've realized, the struggle is real. And it's ongoing. Um, working with Upstart Crow, the intersectionality of identity, issues of equity, and the ramifications of all of this on representation are things that I've come head to head with doing the work. I have to admit that when we first start doing this work, I don't know if we were consciously thinking about all these things I'm talking to you about. It seemed like enough of a struggle to just get a bunch of women to work for us for literally almost nothing, right? We were all working for a uh, uh, cut of the box office back in those days, right? Um, but then I realized that there was a hunger for this work. After our first production, when we did Titus Andronicus, all these incredibly skilled, talented women were dying to audition for us, and I was like, are you sure? Like, I couldn't believe the caliber of women who were coming and wanting to work with us, because I was like, you know I can't pay you. You know I could maybe give you enough to buy a nice pair of shoes or something, but it didn't matter, because they were hungry to be in the space that this work creates. Sarah Harlett, who played Richard III for us recently, I remember her in an early rehearsal. It was one of these large group scenes in King John, and you know, we're in these political places, everyone's on stage, and she looked around and she said to me, I'm on stage with her, and 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 that never happens. Not in classical work. Men get to work with each other all the time. Women, you're one of two or three maybe five or six if you're lucky, right? So having access to this space was what made women come to me willing to work for nothing. I knew that after we did um, Titus Andronicus that we could continue to do this work, right? And women would continue to work for us, but then I would be enabling a system of inequity. I would actually be saying like, actually women don't need to be paid for the work because they'll come and work for me for nothing and we'll do the work and it'll be great and it'll be really, really fine. So we knew we had to stop doing that. And we decided that we would, from then on, pay people for their work. And we looked for partners to do that with. And we were really fortunate to find a partner first in Seattle Shakespeare Company that did bring down the house with us in 2017 and Richard III in 2018. And then we're really fortunate also to go on to partner with Oregon Shakespeare Festival. And we're going to do a new production of Bring Down the House in 2020. Yeah, yeah. And then it's never enough, right? In a good way. It's just never enough. Because right when I was feeling like, we've got these partners, we're paying people, and then I realized, you know, looking back at who I was as an undergraduate, I was like, we really haven't paid enough attention to diversity in terms of race, in terms of who's, especially in terms of casting. We need to be more intentional about this. As I said, it takes great skill and ability and training to do classical work. Young people of color are often told, this work isn't for you. You shouldn't audition for that. You're not going to get cast, and the plays really aren't about you anyway. And I wholeheartedly reject that. I believe the future of classical work, this genre that I love so much, lies in the hands of young people of color. And if you are one, I am talking about you. <laughs> this work is about us today, if we make it about us today. What we need to do is take the work, look at what's dated, look at what's prejudiced and biased in it, and reimagine it in how we interpret it for us today. Because these plays can be about everybody, and these plays can be done by every body. Here's the most dangerous thing you can say about um, classical work, I think, right? Most dangerous thing you can say about classical work is say, well, the language is so beautiful. It's iambic pentameter, it's poetry, it's Shakespeare. Of course it's universal. Of course it is, right? Because it's Shakespeare, it's classical. We all agree. Because there are whole swaths of populations for whom this play, these plays are not universal necessarily at first glance, right? They don't just naturally speak to everybody. 
We need to be conscious of that as contemporary artists. We need to show people themselves on stage, right? We can show them that these plays can be about them, can, they can inhabit them, and then we can give them the training and the experience that gives them the confidence and the skill to do this work. I'm going to leave you with an anecdote. Um, after we did Bring Down the House, uh, our costume designer, Chris Shurgi, who also teaches costumes at Seattle Academy for Arts and Sciences across the way, um, she told me about how she was accosted, mobbed, swarmed by a pack of uh, teenage girls who had come to see Bring Down the House the night before. And then she, she sent this to me in an email. They told me that seeing all those women together made them realize that they can tell any story. Their bodies, exactly as they are, every color, shape, and age, can tell stories of vengeance, power, love, regret, and honor. They also realize after reading the program that it is likely that they will have to make those opportunities for themselves and each other, just like you, Betsy, and Kate have done, and that it is possible to do that while simultaneously being teachers, mothers, wives, and professionals. It kind of makes me cry every time I read that. I keep that email with me to remind myself about the thing I've always known, which is the praise, the admiration, the reviews, the accolades, all the things that people think that's what artists and especially theater artists crave. Those are the reasons why we do it, the applause. That's not actually why we do it, right? Why we actually do it is for the impact that we have, is not to actually get this email, but what this email means, what's happening out there, right? That why I do this work is to introduce a new generation of artists and audiences into the work that I love deeply, classical work, and let them see that they do belong, that the stories are about them, and that they can find themselves in those plays and make them about the world that they live in today. Thank you.